Um, so um, Shaheen called me up and said, hey, we're doing this event. Why don't you come talk? And I said, I don't, I don't know what I would talk about. And he said, well, you've got kind of a unique perspective because I've worked for really big companies and I've worked for really small companies and now I'm kind of working for a small company inside of a big company. And so it's, um, it's interesting how, how, um, how life kind of gives you this um, funny twist of fate. Uh, I started out with uh, HP uh, in engineering, went on to marketing. Uh, I was a better talker than a coder, I guess. Um, and then uh, did, uh, did IBM, SGI, Cray, lots of other companies. Um, so obviously with IBM and HP, you've got you know, really big companies, lots of resources, lots of process. Um, but also worked for a couple of startups. Worked for a little tiny startup called SuperSale up in uh, Minnesota. Uh, our idea was we were going to revolutionize the, the uh, used car market by reading the VIN off the car and populating the database and throwing everything up on the web. Problem is most of the stuff people care about is not available from the VIN, like color and mileage and stuff like that. Um, and then I went to Calzada. Calzada was a silicon startup, lasted three years, burned through $103 million, Battery Ventures, in fact, was, was our lead VC. And in fact, DLA Piper was our, uh, was our, uh, were our attorneys. So um, some, some things I can share about that that uh, I think you might find, might find useful. Um, and after Calzada went under, um, all I really got was a t-shirt. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind if you're gonna do a startup. Sometimes all you get is the t-shirt. And you have to be okay with that going in. I was okay. With that, I mean, I, I'd, I'd had a successful career at IBM and HP before that, and Cray, Cray in between, and I was okay if it failed, but I was going to pour everything I had into making sure it succeeded. And we really thought we had had it had it going. I mean, and most people thought we were going to be phenomenally successful. And there's a lesson in there I'll get to in just a minute. Uh, as of the summer, I went to AMD because there's a little startup in AMD called Servers. You know, AMD grew to about 24% market share and promptly blew it. Uh, I mean, really blew it. Our market share now is about 2.5%. That, that rounds to zero, right, for those of you who aren't math majors, right? That rounds to zero. And, um, but the uh, opportunity is huge for us to rebuild that, so it's like a startup. It's like a startup all over again, but with the strength of being with a big company. I and mean, if you think about what's good about big companies and what's good about little companies, and there's good about, about both of them, Big companies, you've got lots of resources, but you've got lots of process. Um, you have very slow decision making because of that process, right? Be part of that is because you, if you're already successful, you don't take risk. If you have everything to win and nothing to lose, you take risk. And that's the heart of being in a startup, is being comfortable with taking risks, comfortable making decisions without enough data because any decision is better than no decision. A bad decision is better than no decision because at least you're making progress towards something. And you may learn it was the wrong decision and take a mid-course correction, and that's okay. In a startup, that's okay. In a big company, not so okay. Um, I remember once an executive at HP told me, uh, you could make a mistake once, but if you make a mistake twice, that means you didn't learn from the first one, you're out, okay? In a startup, the key thing is to recognize early that you've made a mistake, that you didn't, get, you didn't gauge the market correctly, and then pivot. And uh, people, a lot of people say Calzada failed because we were early. That's true. We, were also, we also failed because we refused to pivot uh, when the market tried to give us some feedback. Um, pretty much with, in a big company, you've got lots of good management there. There's processes to help develop your career. There's training. They send you to all kinds of classes. And they really develop you as a, as a professional. Uh, that does not happen in a startup. You are on your own, okay? Because in, in, and you're working your tail off uh, 24 by 7. There's no time to go develop yourself, right? The thing about uh, Little is um, uh, there's nothing there. We'd get there and we'd get, have a meeting and we'd say, well, we need to do such and such. How do we do that? There's no, there's no cookbook. There's no process. It's never been done before. You have to make it up. That is incredibly exciting uh, or, or terrifying, depending on your personality. If you're going to do a startup, make sure you find that exciting because you're going to do it every day. You're going to do it all day. Okay? If you want somebody that knows how it's done and tells you how to do it, don't go work for a startup. Okay? Um, and, and the... the, the 
the thing about little is what I call a rose-colored glasses effect, okay? Um, a good entrepreneur has to have rose-colored glasses. A, a successful entrepreneur knows when to take them off. And what do I mean by that? Uh, you have to be passionate and positive. There can be no doubt in your mind that you're going to win because so many things are stacked against you, okay? If you're, if you're doing a, especially a, a high-tech startup, especially, right? Um, but those rose-colored glasses can work against you. Because if the market, if the customer is telling you something you don't want to hear, you better take those rose-colored glasses off and take a good hard look at, the at what the data says in terms of that market feedback. The data told Calzada, we will not deploy 32-bit servers. I don't care how power efficient they were. There were five watts. We had a server that only consumed five watts with DRAM. How can you not buy that? Well, no one's going to recompile back to 32-bit. That's how. And they told us that. But when you've sold this vision to the investors, and they've given you $50 million at that time, or $48 million at that time, it's hard for you to go back and say, just kidding. We're going to put this thing on ice. We're going to wait. We're going to wait for ARM to release 64-bit uh, V8 cores so we can deliver the, we couldn't do that. So what did we do? We doubled down, and we repeated the same mistake twice. Remember when I told you about my HP executive, about when you make two mistakes, you're out? Well, that's what happened. Two strikes, we were out. We burned through $103 million. We were ready to tape out our 64-bit product, but we're out of money. So we go to the board, can you give us a bridge loan? Yeah, sure, no problem, we'll give you a bridge loan. Somebody was saying earlier, the money's not there until it's in the bank. Right? We thought we had a $35 million bridge loan from our existing investors. With three days of cash left, they changed their mind. And we laid everybody off two weeks before Christmas. We shut the company down. Right? So you, you got to be okay with that being a potential outcome. You got to do everything you can to make sure that's not the outcome. The most important thing you can do to avoid that is get very intimate with customers. Focus all your energy on winning a couple of those customers. Don't worry about the market. I was VP of marketing, but really I was, I was VP of a handful of accounts that I spent a lot of time with, right? Just really focusing on what they needed. But if they come back and say, you know what, that product's not what I need. I need you to do this and this and this before I buy, you better listen to them. Because otherwise you're just spending more and more money and you're going to run off a cliff. So that's what happened. Our rose-colored glasses were surgically implanted. We couldn't take them off. Okay? And our, our leader was Barry Evans, fantastic at raising money. He was so well connected. He understood the products, the technology, the industry. He understood the, 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 the financing side of it. He was brilliant. But he couldn't take those rose-colored glasses off. And we spent too much money. And we were too early to market, right? So when you're going after it, um, don't try to solve your problems by hiring somebody to manage something for you. Okay, you got to do it yourself. Get your engineers and a couple of people in marketing and sales. But you're primarily focused on engineering to get the product out. When you start adding other resources, HR, extra finance guys, extra marketing guys, uh, you're on the wrong path. Because until you get that proof point, until you get that demonstration of customer value that they can consume, then you just, all you have is PowerPoint. PowerPoint's great for VCs, right? Because they, they, see, they see, you saw the numbers earlier today, right? From Battery, from, from uh, Adrian. What was it, five, 500? Was it 5,000 five, five presentations, right? Five, they, they know PowerPoint, okay? But at the end of the day, when you're raising more money or you're trying to do an IPO, you're trying to get to that growth stage, you've got to have real proof that customers see value and they're willing to deploy to get the value, because otherwise it's just, it's just PowerPoint. The other thing to remember is that pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. Um, what that means, don't get too greedy. 
you have an exit opportunity, don't dismiss it just because you think you're worth a billion dollars. Okay? And that has what happened to us. We had opportunities to exit. We didn't take it because we thought we were worth a billion dollars. After all, we've raised a hundred million dollars. We're pretty cool. Okay, well, you know what? We weren't a, worth a hundred billion dollars because it was gonna take at least another hundred million dollars to get this company to, to cash flow positive, at least another hundred million dollars. So what would the valuation have to be? Well, for a VC to be interested, that means you're gonna have to have 200 pre-money, 200 million pre-money, you're gonna have to at least be able to show $800 million, a billion, for them to take the risk to invest that additional $100 million. Uh, got too rich for everybody's blood, they left. So this other option is kind of interesting, and it depends on where you are in life and if, what, 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 what it is about a startup that you find intriguing and valuable. If what you find intriguing and satisfying is being able to make a difference, you could do that within a big company in a startup venture within a big company, even IBM. IBM has this way of managing acquisitions where they put an executive in charge and they say, you're gonna run this acquisition like it's a startup. Don't run it like it's IBM. Treat it completely different. All rules are off. You can do whatever you need to make this business successful. And it literally is like running a startup within IBM. Within AMD, we're doing the same kind of thing within our server business. So this model, you, you can get so much more done in a startup than you can in a big company. And many big companies are realizing that they should manage some parts of their business like it's a startup. Remember when um, Apple first created the Apple Lisa, right? Remember that? They, they put that team off in a separate building, separate management, completely cut them off from a process standpoint, and let them go off and invent the Apple Lisa, which is, of course, the beginning of the real change in the industry. And so you can do this, and it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot less downside, so there's a lot less risk, so there's a lot less upside. Right? In a big company, to have a meaningful impact to earnings per share is difficult in any business unit, because uh, it took so long to, to build up that, the, those earnings and that the, the magnitude of the, of the business is just very large to see a, see a blip. But it can be very personally satisfying, making a difference, leading a team, uh, changing, changing uh, some, pa some part of the industry, and, and help it, helping the company uh, innovate. It can be very satisfying. Um, so it's all about where your passion lies, right? If your passion lies in making the big return, don't do this. If your passion lies in making a difference while still maybe having some semblance of a personal life, uh, this is actually a pretty, pretty, good, uh, pretty good alternative. Yeah, so my advice, um, if you're going to go to a startup, just remember, management mistakes can trump a good, a good idea. Recognize your mistakes early and change direction. Don't be afraid to go back and tell your investors you learned something. Don't be afraid to tell them you've got a better strategy. Don't do it too often because you're going to run out of cash. Right? And cash is king. Remember that the, every dollar you spend as, as an early stage startup is worth, any, is worth at least $10. At least $10 because every, everybody's looking for a 10 to 1 return on, 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 on uh, capital invested. Right? Um, Focus, focus, focus. If, if you want to run a startup, you need to be spending more time outside the company than inside the company. You need to hire good engineers and good managers to, to, to deliver the product and get out and sell it. You're the one with the vision if you're running this thing. Nobody can sell it like you can. You can't hire a salesman to, to can do what you can do if it's your idea and you have the passion and you have the vision of what you're trying to change in the industry. So get, if you're not comfortable with getting out there and selling, don't run a startup. Um, and uh, as I said, always think about consumable value, not theory. We had this wonderful fabric in Calzada. It was a point-to-point -point fabric, uh, 10 gigabit links. Uh, each SOC had five links. Our next generation had six, so we could do 3D torus. I mean, this was really cool technology. Turns out it scared the hell out of the IT guys. Scared the hell out of the IT guys. What do you mean? You're not, that's not a manageable switch. What do you mean? You want you to put a fabric in here that's not Cisco or Broadcom? You know, you, are you nuts? No, it's not that kind of fabric. It's you, all of a sudden you're explaining. You know you've lost when you're having to explain. 
right? You know you've lost when you have to explain it. So make sure it's consumable value. A good example is um, a lot of people have tried to make money in HPC by having a better algorithm. It's really hard to make money with a better algorithm. It's, you just can't monetize it, and, or it can't be deployed within a people's existing software infrastructure, right? They're dependent on, they need somebody else, like an ANSYS, to pick up the algorithm and put it in the software and be able to deliver it as a product, right? So it's, 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 be, be careful, make sure your, your value is really consumable. It's been said several times today, partner, partner, partner. Get out and network. You've gotta be networking constantly because people want to help you. Everybody loves to see a startup succeed. Everybody wants to be close to and know somebody who is in a startup that succeeded. So people really will go out of their way to give you advice, listen to it. Don't necessarily take it. Every good idea is usually surrounded by a couple of bad ideas, right? But listen to it, and people will help you. Uh, somebody asked earlier, how do you get market research if I'm a startup and I don't have funding? It's actually quite easy, because, because a, lot of, a lot of folks, uh, analysts, will learn from you, and they will become better analysts. Well, Peter's here, right? Peter and I used to, he wasn't a client of mine. He would spend hours drinking, I mean talking <laughs> with me uh, about our ideas and what we were doing, because he learned from it, right? And I got a lot of value back out of that. Go to the IDC, IDC holds their breakfast every year at, H, at, HP, at Supercomputing and ISC, right? And Earl Joseph and his guys get up there and they, they share all this stuff and it's free, right? So you don't have, to, the whole time I was at Calzada for three years, I spent almost zero dollars on market research. Almost zero dollars. You don't need to pay a payout for it. But get out there and uh, get as much work, uh, work and value as you can from your advisors. And speaking of advisors, your board of directors, they are, they are helping you, they're, they're managing you, okay? That's their job, to make sure you stay on track, okay? They're not necessarily good advisors, they're not. So, so your advisors are people in the industry. Your advisors are other CEOs, other CTOs, um, people, uh, end users. I mean, one of our greatest advisors at Calzada was Frank Frankowski at Facebook. He ended up becoming a, a member of the board, but he would spend tons of time with us just giving us advice. Do this, don't do this. You should have listened to it. Um, so you gotta take off those rose-colored glasses and uh, listen to your customers. And then don't forget, at the end, keep calm, take the money and run, okay? If you're doing it for a startup, it's, it's gotta be about the win. And the win is when you can take the money and run. Okay, thank you. Do we have time for questions or? Yeah, take a couple It's, it, it's a really good question and it's very painful. Um, so what happens, as I was the marketing guy, so I, I'm, the, I'm the asshole who had to come in and tell the CEO we were wrong, okay? And um, that's your job, right? But it's also, you, 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 you gotta do the right thing. Um, once you've lost that argument, then you gotta turn around and tell the customers and the press and everybody else why you're on the right strategy, even though you have reservations. Right. I, 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 know, I know what you're saying, and I, I don't have a good answer. Because I think you, you asked, what is the rationale? I think it was irrational. It was irrational. Yeah, we would say, no, we know it's lower power. Yeah, but that's not why people were buying, right? Um, we'd say, you know, it, you know, the real shocker was when Intel came out with the Aviton pricing. It was half what we thought it would be. They got very, very aggressive with Aviton pricing. And um, all of a sudden the door just slammed shut for ARM, right? I mean, Facebook was at the Open Server Summit last week in Santa Clara, and uh, they weren't there, they sent a video. <laughs> and on the video, Dan Cordry's on, on the video saying why they chose Aviton. 
right? And it's got lots of functionality, and it's got decent performance, but the fact of the matter is it was really, really cheap. If you're going up against a, a, major, a major company with lots of resources, and, and, and the only thing you have is lower price, you're dead. You're already dead. Because they can put you out of business with a stroke of a pen, and it won't show up on their earnings per share. Because this is small, this is insignificant, it's one deal. Everybody heard of um, uh, Marvell went into uh, Baidu and, and competed with Calzada. We had a little bug on our chip and, and they won, they won. And it was a little 32-bit part that Baidu deployed with um, a ser server, basically photo tier, photo storage within the Baidu cloud. Um, and then they made a mistake, they announced the win. Intel came in and made sure Baidu would never buy another ARM chip anytime soon, right? Intel just made them an offer they couldn't refuse. It didn't show up on their earnings per share, but it sure shut the door for ARM. Yes. And, and, and inside that comment, there's, there's a very important realization. You, the, the startups that are really successful are not the ones that displace existing technology. They do something that hasn't been done before. They do something that couldn't be done before. Okay. Or the economic value has to be so great, only an idiot would not buy it. Like when I was at IBM and we did Power 4 and Power 5, I could go in a customer and say, tell you what, I'll give you all the free servers you want. How many you want? It's all free. It was, because we were able to pay, the customer could pay for it by what they saved on their Oracle license, and then some, and get brand new, brand new faster servers. Nobody could argue with that. Our market share went from 13% to 56%. Right? So unless you have that kind of, whoa, value proposition, you need to be someplace where, where no, one's, no one's gone before. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks for the opportunity.